And we're back carrying on our exploration of the relationship between physics specifically and the considerations of an embodied being, or what I'm notionally calling money cognition, but I don't mean to suggest a theory, I just mean to suggest thinking things through from an embodied point of view. And we've been over some ground today, and we are already in these videos, and we've um, singled out measurement as a very, very important thing to consider, because physics typically does its measurement using abstract units, hiding the fact that, and when it comes to space at least, the meter is in fact a middle term unit constructed, imagined, by a specific kind of being, a Frenchman. Not any particular Frenchman, it comes from the French imagination. Uh, and the very abstractness of the business of physics loses sight of this, perhaps. Physics is brilliant at measurement. That's the one thing that sets it aside from all the other sciences which can be seen as mere conglomerations. The, all branches and disciplines of science are mixtures of various tricks, knacks, um, habits, methods, insights, in order to gain competence in a specific domain. Physics does not limit itself to the specific domain and it fetishizes measurement because it is brilliant at measurement. But measurement in physics is built on one weird trick. The trick is this, the postulate that one can speak of the speed of light in a vacuum. This, as a constant, is a postulate of relativity theory. That freezes light, and from an embodied point of view, this is a bit odd, because the word speed here does not mean what speed means to an embodied being, things moving faster or slower. Light here does not mean what light means to an embodied being, and there's lots to say about the confusion in our words about light and energy, and we'll be coming back to that. And a vacuum is, of course, an entirely notional idea. Um, so... That's the one weird trick that physics has, and it gives rise then to objections necessarily from an embodied center where we find things rather differently laid out. This came to the fore in a long-running debate between Mr. Einstein of relativity theory fame and Mr. Henri Bergson, a very popular Frenchman who also liked to wear a hat. And they disagreed, they couldn't unify their understandings of space and time, and here we are, and we're still finding a lot to talk about in this area. Talking about time turns out to be very, very difficult, doesn't it? And talking about space seems to be easier. But if we take Einstein seriously, then space-time is one thing, it's not space and time, it's not we naively think of space as a box and time as a line. That's a naivety in our thinking. But if we take space, the continuity of space-time seriously, we, there's no room in that picture for the unfolding of things serially for an embodied being. This was Bergson's point. He wanted to point to what we call lived time. The words are not very good. So when we think about space alone, we are idealizing. And it's a very important kind of idealization. It's a brilliant kind of idealization. Um, and that's why geometry is so important. Now, if we are not coming from the same place as Mr. Einstein, we're coming from a place more like the place that Mr. Bergson came from, um, then what could we say about time? Well, I'm going to draw here on a chap you probably never met. His name is Wei Wu Wei. His real, his, his human name was Terence Gray. And he wrote a series of books on Buddhist epistemology, roughly speaking. And this one's called Fingers Pointing to the Moon. And he, he, he makes a very clear statement here. He says, three-dimensionality is a function of our senses. Time is the boundary of our senses. That would have been Bergson's position as well, I think. Time is the boundary of our senses is a very nice way of suggesting that if there are, if four-dimensional continuum is considered, as Mr. Einstein does, then we have access only to a subset of it mediated by the body. Wei Wu Wei goes on to say time is the fourth dimension perceived serially, that is, as a succession of phenomena, one thing after another. We live, he says, in the fourth dimension without perceiving it sensorially. We've no 
organ for the perception of time, that's absolutely true. But it is evident everywhere by inference when we know where to look for signs of it. Now he goes on and gives some examples of that, but rather than read his examples to the camera, I found this shell on the table over there. A very nice big clam shell. Reassuring these solid, physical, physical tangible objects. Good shell. Gorgeous yoke. But when we look at a shell, we're seeing it as a solid, as having a relatively stable form in space-time, you must say. And to see something as a solid is, well, it's not surprising, it happens to us all the time. Um, but if we could see all four dimensions simultaneously, I don't believe there could be solids in there, solids and fluids. These are the way that matter appears to us. And when we look at this, we can see time in this apparent spatially configured shell quite well. You see these ridges up here. They were formed dynamically. They came into being through time. And if you look at them and you think of the manner in which sand dunes are created and which ripple patterns um, form in sand, you can see the same kind of sense of we're seeing through time, we're seeing the temporal processes that give rise to this, to what appears to be relatively fixed in space, to an embodied being. So, I want to speak of our imagination and time. We are, as an embodied being, I have the fond hope that, you know, we're brilliant. <laughs> our imagination is good. But if you come up with something in your imagination, uh, you want to reality test it, um, because, you know, if it's purely imaginary, uh, well, that's the work of fantasy, isn't it? I mentioned in the last video um, the importance of measurement and the abstract nature, manner in which physics proceeds to measurement. The meter, in particular, as the spatial unit, um, is treated in physics as an abstract quantity, whereas in fact it's the, an imaginative construction of an embodied creature, an ideal French person, who's somewhere between one and two meters tall. Um, I did previous videos on some perplexities about the way that we see, and in those I pointed to something that very important that happened to our imagination in the way that we see and think about space. It came about in the 16th century when people started looking through tubes. Tubes like this one, you see this? This is a, an empty toilet roll holder. Um, but the tubes they were using back then were much fancier. They were telescopes and microscopes. Uh, but the, the effect is pretty much the same on the imagination. Um, when people started peering through telescopes and microscopes, boy did they find good stuff like the moons of Jupiter and bacteria. But something funny happens when you peer through a tube. I'm peering through this tube now and suddenly the camera appears to me in a circle. There's a fixed field of vision and it's separate from my field of bodily operation. I can move my body around here and the camera occupies a distinct space. When I remove the tube, that's gone. Now, when tubes were employed, two new spaces arose in the imagination. One is what we call outer space, the macrocosm, and one the microcosm, where you look down the tube at the bugs and the weird stuff going on at the very small scales. Remember, our mesoscopic nature as embodied beings means we have a center. So from these center, tubes opened up two new vast worlds. So I'd like to wrap up this video with just a little game, and it's a little magic trick I was taught by a guy called Paul Churchland. He's a philosopher of mind, and he wrote a, a book with a horrible title called Scientific Realism and the Plasticity of Mind. We won't traffic in such notions here, but we'll make use of his experiment. What Paul Churchland suggested doing was going on top of a tall building at night, which I duly did, standing there and looking up at the night sky. Now, while you're standing there, you might ask yourself which way is up. It's a very interesting question for an embodied being to ask themselves. It's not obvious which way is up. Now, we conventionally will point in the direction of our spine when standing and say that way is up. That's roughly where the sky is, isn't it? 
but there's many directions you could point in. And while you're standing there on top of a roof, if you can identify two of the more prominent bodies in the night sky, let's say Jupiter and Saturn, then you can employ your massive, big, well-trained imagination. Because since all this good work was done with tubes, the solar system lives in your imagination as a little model, as a little bit of sun in the center and a whole bunch of orbiting planets. And it's a rather peculiar fact of this construct that those planets all lie in the same plane. Weirdly, the moon lies in the same plane as well, although there's no obvious reason for that. So having found two objects up there in the night sky, you now use your Greek knowledge. The Greeks are great for this. Three points define a plane. See, the triangles had such a hold on the Greek imagination. And we've got the Greek imagination. So three points define a plane. There's Saturn. There's Jupiter. I'm standing on the third point. That's the plane of the ecliptic. Now you suddenly realize you're standing on a ball. And up is not the direction you thought it was. There's nothing to do with your spine. Up is the orthogonal direction to the plane of the ecliptic. So we went from naively thinking we knew which way it was up to thinking a bit about space and suddenly up is redefined. That's a pretty good trick, Paul. Thank you very much. I thanked you for it once um, and it still works in my imagination. And I want to continue in this vein with subsequent videos exploring the spatial imagination. We'll try and get to the genius of Kepler and we'll have a great fun with embodied geometry. There's so much to do around here.